morning. How about we give one big round of applause for all these people getting baptized, lives that are being changed. <laughs> Pretty incredible. Summer, MJ, Kaya. Man, that was awesome. I loved it, loved it. And I don't know if you caught it, but um, you know, Jesus got baptized by Juan the Baptist up there. So <laughs> Pastor Dean pointed that out to me this morning. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Hey, there's just so many great things going on in the life of our church. And it's just, honestly, it's so humbling just to get to be a small part of it. And I hope you're feeling it. I hope you sense it. Uh, God is on the move here. And it's really special that we get to be a part of it. Hey, why don't we pray? And then we're going we're gonna to jump right in and, and have our Bible study together. And so, Father, I pray that you would continue to work, continue to move. God, move us out of the way so you can do what only you do. God, I pray that Jesus would increase and we would decrease. That you would turn up the volume of your word, turn down all the distractions in our lives. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock, our redeemer, our strong tower. We run to you. We need you. I pray that you would speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, go ahead and get out your listening guide that you received on your way in. If, if you haven't filled out your, uh, your Connect card yet, we want to know how we can be praying for you. So you can go ahead and fill that out and turn it in on your way out. This week, I had, uh, had a pretty eventful week. And I had an opportunity to travel down to the Dominican Republic to meet with a missionary partner there. And me and Pastor Mitch and Pastor DJ and some others had a chance to go down there. It was a very quick trip. We, were, we went down on Wednesday and came back on Thursday. And our purpose, our mission was we're meeting with some missionaries and mapping out a mission trip for this summer that we're trying to put together for our student ministry and some of their parents and maybe some of our young adults. And so we originally planned this trip to go about a month ago. But uh, one of those bad storms sat right on top of the Dominican Republic, and there was some flooding, so we had to reschedule. And so when we rescheduled our trip, we, we booked on one of those discount airlines. Why are you laughing? <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not going to tell you the name of the airline. That would be terrible. But it was, it was the one that has all yellow airplanes. <laughs> and on the side of their plane, it says, Spirit. But that's not the name. That's just because when you're on the plane, that's who they want you to talk to, Holy Spirit. <laughs> please help this plane to get there. Holy Spirit, send Jesus back right now. Please just send him back right now. You, you know, you, you, get, you get a good deal on those plane rides, though, because I think we only paid 75 cents for the ticket. <laughs> but the baggage fees were like, you know, $600 for a carry-on or something like that. <laughs> I think I had to pay $4 just to bring my sunglasses on the plane with me. You know, they charge you for everything. And uh, we, we, you know, we, this was a, it was a quick trip. And so we needed a direct flight. And the only way to do that was to fly out of Orlando. And the only way to catch this flight meant we had to get up at 3 in the morning. So we wake up at 3 in the morning. And we meet. And we drive all the way over to Orlando. And there's only one thing worse than having to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning for a flight. And that is to get all the way to Orlando to find out that your flight has been delayed. And so we got there and it was delayed by an hour and then two hours and then three hours and then four hours. And by this point, my blood pressure is rising because I don't know if you've noticed this about me yet or not. I mean, I've only been here since January, but I'm kind of a planner. You know, I like to think ahead. I like to have my day kind of mapped out for me. And I'm just starting to, to, to boil on the inside. In fact, Amanda called me while I'm in the airport, and she could tell I was a little bit tense, and she said, you mad, bro? <laughs> and I'm just, like, fuming that these people have ruined my life. Like, the way, as far as I'm concerned, they've ruined my whole life. My life is over because they've, they've just, you know, done such a disaster with all this. And so I'm just looking around, fuming, and, you know, just kind of self-focused and all this stuff. And I look over... And Pastor DJ is over here, and he is just smiling, having a good old time. You know, I think Bob Marley's always playing through his head, like, all the time. <laughs> I said, don't worry about a thing, because every little thing is going to be all right, you know? And, and DJ is just always happy. I've never seen this guy rattled. I mean, just always happy. This guy's glass is half full all the time. You know, never rattled, always happy, living the good life, no worry about tomorrow, everything's going to be all right. 
You guys know anybody like that? You know, eternal optimists are just always happy. You guys know, some of y'all may be like that. You people make me sick. <laughs> Don't you ever have a bad day? I do. Opposition all the time, spiritual opposition, opposition with, you know, my kids. You know, y'all think, y'all think, oh, you pastors, y'all live such charmed lives. Everything's just perfect for you pastors. I hate to break it to you. Uh, I have what I would like to call a real family with real children and a real marriage and real challenges from time to time. And I know you do too. And that's part of being a Christian. And to be honest with you, some of us might want to take our cues from Pastor DJ and others from time to time. And in the midst of spiritual opposition, in the midst of persecution, when we feel like a certain airline has just ruined our lives, we probably need to just look up and look to Jesus and look to the one who's the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who's holding all things together, the one who may give us a flight delay for a reason, a purpose, because God is sovereign. He holds all things together. We've been studying this uh, story of the early church, and we're calling this series Lift Off because this is the story of how the early church lifted off. And we believe there's some things that we can learn from the early church that we can apply today. So if you're new with us or, or maybe you've missed a couple of weeks, let me just remind you where we've been in the story. And as you know, every week I like to give a little bit of a review, and this is for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm sure you've forgotten some of these things, or, or maybe you've had some crises in your own family that have made you forget some of these, but also... When all of this was being written, it was written as one long, continuous story. There were no chapter and verse divisions. So all of this was written to be read out loud all at once. And so sometimes you have to go back and connect the dots just to remember where you've come from. So here's what's going on in the story. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And he says, who do y'all say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, that's exactly right, Peter. And on that statement, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And if you fast forward a little bit, at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, he's standing around with his disciples in his resurrected body and he gives them a mission. We call it the Great Commission. He says in Matthew 28, I want you to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, just as you saw on the screens, just as we do today, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, and don't worry, I'm with you. I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. And the disciples are thinking, wait a minute, Jesus, you want us to go to every nation? I mean, my goodness, we're just a group of 12 people in this small little town in the Middle East. How are we going to go to every nation? And in Acts 1-8, Jesus says, don't worry. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's where they were, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And if you follow through the book of Acts or even through the New Testament, that's exactly what took place. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. There are miracles taking place. This big group gathers together. This crowd wants to see the miracles. And so Peter stands up and preaches, and 3,000 people give their life to Christ, get baptized, join the church family. And in an instant, the megachurch moved. It was boomed right there in that moment. Well, not too long after that, Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray because that's what good Jews do. And on their way there, they see this crippled man who's been crippled his entire life. And he's begging for money. And so Peter and John look at him and say, hey, instead of money, how about this? In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And a miracle happens. This guy gets up. His legs have never worked. He's 40 years old. Gets up and walks, and he's leaping and praising God. And everybody starts to see it. Another crowd forms. Peter says, got a crowd? I got a sermon. He stands up and preaches. 2,000 more people come to Christ. So now the church is at about 5,000 people. Then, by the time you get to Acts chapter 4, these disciples are under persecution. The religious leaders don't like that all these people are turning to Christ. So the same religious pe people that crucified Jesus are now persecuting these disciples, throwing them in jail, threatening their lives, threatening their families, beating them. But these disciples, they said, look, you can do whatever you want. We are not going to stop talking about Jesus. We can't stop talking about what we've seen and what we heard. So what in the world did they see? I mean, what in the world did they hear that would make them risk their lives? Well, they saw these miracles. And they saw Jesus coming alive inside of them. And it was no longer this perfunctory religion. It was no longer about checking the boxes. God was alive in them, just like I see in many of you. God came alive in them, and it changed everything. In Acts chapter 5, there started to be a little bit of a division in the church. There's this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they were part of the church. They were believers, but 
Satan had tempted them and they fell into temptation and they lied and God struck them dead. God wanted to preserve the unity of the church. And then in the last part of Acts chapter five, it says that there were now more believers than ever trusting in Christ. So, I mean, follow the math. 3,000 in Acts chapter two, two more thousand in Acts chapter three, we're at 5,000. By the time you get to Acts chapter five, more than ever before, so somewhere around 10,000 people trusting in the Lord, following Jesus, this movement is growing like crazy. And then you get to Acts chapter six, and there's this rumor that there's racism in the church. Boy, I'm so glad that we don't deal with that today. And all of a sudden, this, this little rift has an opportunity to divide the church. And so God gives the apostles this idea, this solution to help manage what could spin the church out of control. He gives them deacons. And so they appoint these seven godly people to be deacons. And a deacon has two jobs in the early church. The first job is to be an extension of the pastors, the apostles. They're there to help uh, with whatever the needs are of the pastors. How can I serve? How can I help? And so they're serving the tables. They're serving the widows. But the other job that they have is to protect the unity of the church. It's really big. That's why in our church, our deacons do those same two things. They're helping to assist the needs of the pastors, and they're helping to protect the unity of our church. That's why, from time to time, if a deacon hears someone gossiping, they might tell you to shut your mouth, you know, in Jesus' name and stuff. You know, because... It's not because they don't like you and it's not because they're mean or, or not for you or unspiritual. Opposite. A job of a deacon is not to stir it up. It's to tamp it down. That's what they did in the early church. That's what we do today. So when you get to Acts chapter six, you see these deacons, you see them serving, you see the mission going forward, you see this incredible unity, but there's this one deacon who stands out among them. And this deacon just could not keep his mouth shut. He had to, he had to keep talking about Jesus. And that's where we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Here's what it says. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So remember that, multiplied greatly, okay? Because remember, Acts chapter 2, how many people came to Christ? 3,000. Then Acts chapter 3, how many people? Two more thousand. So 2,000 plus 3,000 is? 5,000. Okay, then you've got Acts chapter 5. More than ever, people are coming to Christ. So we've got this, this faster addition that's happening. It's faster addition. Now they're into multiplication. Okay, so they multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Verse 8. And Stephen, this is one of the deacons, one of those seven deacons, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So the miracles weren't just being done by the apostles or the pastors. The miracles were also being done by the deacons. These deacons were spiritual leaders, and God was using them. And this one deacon, Stephen, he could not stop talking about Jesus of Nazareth. And that offended some people. Which people? Verse 9. Some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, that's what they were called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those of Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and disputed with Stephen. Now, this is a bunch of people, a bunch of religious leaders, Jews, who've grown up worshiping God. They know about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the prophets, and they know all of this stuff from the Old Testament. And normally, these groups did not get along, almost like modern-day Christian denominations. You know what I'm talking about? I guess that doesn't happen here in Pinellas County. But anyway, in some places, different Christian denominations don't get along, kind of like these Jewish groups. They didn't get along. But for this reason, they all got along. And it's interesting how they became strange bedfellows to rise up against Stephen. Why? Because Stephen kept talking about this Jesus of Nazareth. He just couldn't keep his big, fat mouth shut. And he had to keep talking about Jesus. Verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. They knew, they recognized that Stephen had this incredible, supernatural wisdom and every time they would bring something up, Stephen would just put the kibosh on it. And every time they thought they had a good argument, Stephen would put that one out. I mean, Stephen was just supernaturally wise. The scripture says he was spirit-filled, grace-filled, faith-filled, truth-filled. He had this supernatural wisdom. Verse 11, then 
They secretly instigated men who said, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Why'd they do it secretly? Because if they did it publicly, he'd just push them down. He'd snuff it out. There's no way that they could outwit Stephen. He had this supernatural wisdom. It wasn't natural. It was from God. And so what was the lie that they were spreading? That he's saying blasphemy against Moses and God. Now, to say blasphemy against God, that was bad. But in this culture, to blaspheme against Moses... I mean, I can't overestimate how important that was in this culture because to these people, Moses was the guy. I mean, Moses is like the guy that we all follow, wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the law. This is the guy, you know, burning bush, Red Sea, dry ground, 10 plagues, 10 commandments, Charlton Heston. This is the guy. You know what I'm talking about. And so for them to say something bad about Moses, this is is worse than talking about somebody's mama. I mean, these are like fighting words. So Stephen's got all these religious leaders all riled up. They were not happy. Verse 12, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. So now they're getting all the religious leaders involved. And they came upon him, that's Stephen, and seized him and brought him before the council. They call this council the Sanhedrin. And they set up false witnesses, liars. They had, to, they had to put some liars against Stephen just to make the case sound like it was legit. And they said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. So wait a minute. Not only is he speaking bad against Moses, but now he's even speaking out against this holy place. What's the holy place? Where, where are they? Yeah, they're at the temple, the temple complex. Now, they believed that this temple was sacred ground. This is holy ground, okay? Um, We're so grateful for these buildings and this property on Almerton Road. Um, We don't believe this is sacred or holy. We think it's nice and it's awesome and we're grateful that we have it, but this is not holy ground. The holy place is Christ. We are in Christ. That's what makes things holy. But for them, they thought the building was holy. And so now they've got Stephen saying bad things about Moses, you know, the godfather of the faith, they got him saying bad things about the temple, which is like holy ground, sacred place. And he's also saying bad things about the law, which was written by Moses. And these people were experts in the law. They made sure that they followed every jot and tittle of the law. And so this is like the triple crown of threats against Stephen. And yet Stephen kept opening his big fat mouth. Look at verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, the temple. (laughs) You kidding me? And will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. So these are these are fighting words. Now, I don't know how you picture Stephen in this moment. Some of you have told me I kind of have a wild imagination about the Bible, and I, I do think that's true. Do you think Stephen was scared? I mean, when you picture Stephen in this moment, do you picture him biting his fingernails, shaking in his boots, curling up in the fetal position? Is that how you see Stephen? Look at verse 15. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. I I know what you're thinking, face of an angel. Just like Pastor Aaron. I I know, I get that all the time. It's probably, you know, my previous career in modeling. I I don't know, you know. When it says face of an angel, they don't mean that he had this holy glow or anything like that. It means he had this this peace, this supernatural peace. He wasn't going to be rattled. He wasn't shaken. He wasn't biting his fingernails or curling up in the fetal position. This guy had a supernatural peace that passes all understanding. I want you to think about this. He's, he's standing right in front of the Sanhedrin. These are all the who's who of Judaism, all the highest officials, the ones for whom just a few chapters earlier, they were saying, if you keep speaking about Jesus, we're gonna kill your family, we're gonna lock you up in prison, we're gonna beat you, we're gonna torture you, stop talking about Jesus. And yet Stephen's still talking about Jesus. Not only that, these are the same guys who crucified Jesus. Not hypothetically, not by extension, the literal same guys. It's the high priest, Caiaphas. I mean, this guy has the authority to just go off with his head any moment. And there's Stephen with this supernatural calm, peace. 
you know, the exact opposite of what I had at the Orlando airport. <laughs> Peace. And now he's, he's being asked this one little question by Caiaphas, the high priest. Get this, the greatest, highest leader at that time in their religious system is looking at Deacon Stephen. And he asks him this one question, four little words. Are these things so? And in that moment, Stephen had a choice to make. He could have easily said, hey man, those are just a bunch of accusations and look, that's, that's not really what I meant. He could have easily backpedaled. He could have stepped away from the argument. He was quick, he was wiser than all of them. He knew how to get out of this argument. He could have stepped back. But instead, Stephen takes a deep breath and he steps forward. He says, you want, you want to know what I think about Moses? You're making all these accusations about me? Let me tell you about Moses. I know exactly who Moses is. I know about the burning bush. I know about the let my people go. I know about the hyssop branch and the pure and spotless lamb and the doorposts on the frames. And I know about the Red Sea and the dry ground and the 10 plagues and the 10 commandments. I know about Moses. I know about the golden calf. And not only that, I know about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And I know about David and Solomon. I know about all of this stuff. But there's one person that I think I know about that you don't really know about. And it's the one for whom heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. And you've been knowing him a little bit by extension, but I don't think you've ever met him. His name's Yahweh. You've missed out on God. You know some things about God. You know some things about tradition. You love all your religiosity, but you've missed out on the main point. You've missed out on God. And I'll bet that room was as silent as this room. And the problem with Stephen is he just couldn't shut his big mouth. And he kept going in verse 51. You stiff-necked people. That's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Uncircumcised in heart and ears. That's a play on words because we'll talk about that later. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. Notice capital letters. Who's he talking about? Jesus, the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. And he's pointing, you, pointing at him. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. I, I don't know if you could tell, but Stephen's being a little direct with these people. <laughs> he's not mincing words here. In other words, he's looking at all of these religious leaders and he says, you're supposed to be a light to the nations. You become dark. You're supposed to be pulling people in. You've pushed them out. You're supposed to be lifting people up, pointing them to God. What's wrong with you? How dare you? You've missed it. You've gotten so caught up in all your traditions and all your religiosity that you've missed the point. What is wrong with you? How do you think they responded to Stephen's speech? You think they repented? You think they apologized, groveled at his feet? No. Verse 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, like Pastor Aaron at the, the Orlando airport, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Don't miss this. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, remember, at this point, Jesus has already been raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. But in this moment, Jesus Christ himself gets off the throne and stands up to welcome home his first martyr. The Bible says it twice. He's standing to welcome home Stephen. Verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at his feet, the feet of a young man named Saul. Don't forget that. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, 
Do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. You may not be an eternal optimist. You may not uh, see the world the way that others do with the glass half full. But if you're a Christian, you ought to have an opportunity. You ought to have reason to look up. You will face spiritual opposition. You may not have rocks thrown at you until you're dead. You may not be cut limb from limb. You may not be crucified upside down or burned at the stake. But you will have spiritual opposition. Some of you are facing it right now. Some of you are facing spiritual opposition in your marriage, and you keep feeling like it's his fault, it's hers fault. Listen, that is not just a physical opposition. There is a spiritual battle that's going on for your marriage right now. Some of you feel spiritual opposition for your kids. You feel spiritual opposition on the job. You feel spiritual opposition for your family, for your neighbor. You know this is a spiritual war that's taking place. So how do you engage in a spiritual battle? How do you do it? Because there are spiritual battles happening all around. Well, I want to give you five ways that believers can prevail in the midst of spiritual opposition. If you have your listening guide, let's go ahead and take a couple of notes. Five ways believers can prevail in the midst of spiritual opposition. Number one, we need to, dep to depend on the Holy Spirit power. Depend on Holy Spirit power. If you notice how Stephen is described here, he's full of grace, full of wisdom, full of truth, full of faith. He has a face like an angel, full of peace. Where did that peace come from? Holy Spirit. Did you know that the same Holy Spirit that was inside of Stephen is inside of you? If you're a believer in Christ, you have the same Spirit in you that Stephen had, and the same Holy Spirit that's in you, you know what he does? He does what Jesus would do if Jesus were physically present with you. So you might be thinking, man, it would have been awesome to walk with Jesus, talk with Jesus, have Jesus in my life. Boy, then I'd have a lot of faith. I'd walk on water, all that kind of stuff. No, no, you actually have the same Holy Spirit living in you and the Holy Spirit does what Jesus would do if he were physically present. That's what he does in your life. He convicts you of sin. He comforts the afflicted. He helps you in times of trouble. He's your helper. The Holy Spirit is there. He illuminates God's word to you so that you can understand it better. The Holy Spirit does in you what Jesus would do if he were physically present. I think a good way to think about this is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You may want to jot that down. This is a good verse to memorize. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he's going to make your path straight. He's going to keep your path straight. We need to lean on him, depend on him. Not depend on ourselves, but depend on the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Well, how do we know what the Holy Spirit would do? How do we even know what he would say? Easy. Number two, we need to focus on biblical truth. Focus on biblical truth. Did you notice, we, we didn't read his whole speech, but did you see how long Stephen's speech is in Acts chapter 7? I mean, it's the longest speech in the entire book of Acts, and it's all scripture. He's just quoting from memory what he knows about the Old Testament. He's focusing on the Bible. When Stephen is squeezed, scripture comes out. What comes out of you when you're squeezed? What comes out of you? Do you have scripture hidden in your heart? There are some verses that I cling to in times of trouble that sometimes I'll just, driving down the road, I'll just start reciting these verses because I've hidden them in my heart. I've worked really hard to have some verses memorized. And memorization's not easy for me. It's something that I have to work at. There are certain verses that when I think about them, it just puts me back on, on plumb line, on center with Jesus. Some of my verses are, are these, like 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So when I feel like the devil's tempting me, telling me I don't deserve this, I don't belong, he's trying to remind me of my past life, I tell the devil, hey, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Another one is Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You need to put God's word to memory. It will save you from so much spiritual opposition. And if you have a hard time memorizing like I do, maybe you put it to a song. Maybe you put it to a rap. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and sleep does not wither, and all he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, they're like chaff that the wind drives away. Okay, guys, listen to me. There's a little bit of vanilla ice in all of us, I, I know that. Or look, maybe you have a hard time memorizing scripture like I do. How about you start with this one? Start with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Sometimes I like to put my own name in there. Let's say, I recite scripture. For God so loved Aaron that he gave his only son that if Aaron believes in him, he will not perish. Aaron will have everlasting life. You need God's word in your heart because you're going to be squeezed. I have a really good friend, and uh, he's a believer. He's a great, great friend of mine. And uh, every time I go to his house, there's a certain political news station that's always on. Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and for this person, he's a believer, and I love him. He's a friend of mine. But every time, every time he's squeezed, you know what comes out? Politics. Listen to me, church. Your politics are not going to help you in the face of spiritual opposition. Your politics are not going to save you when you have all of this turmoil in your life. When the devil's coming after your marriage, coming after your kids, coming after your family, coming after your faith, you don't need, you don't need, you don't need a political news station. You need the Word of God. I hope that in this next political season coming up, that the people of Indian Rocks are known as people of the Word. Don't get caught up in all of that. Don't get all wrapped up in sideways energy. Keep your minds focused on the word of God and it will save you a lot of turmoil. Number three, when you face spiritual opposition, pray for those who oppose. Pray for those who oppose. Stephen took his cues from Jesus. You remember what Jesus said when he was dying on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Stephen says the same thing. Forgive them, Lord. They don't even know what they're doing. And I believe God heard Stephen's prayer because one of those stiff-necked Jewish leaders was a guy named Saul. And somehow in the economy of God, God had this bigger view of all of this, and he used all of that. Some of you are facing spiritual opposition right now, and you think that you're at war with a person. You think the spiritual opposition is with your ex you think the spiritual opposition is with your neighbor. You think the spiritual opposition is with your boss. Some of you students think that you have a teacher from hell. You don't. Your teacher's not from hell. Your war is with the devil. There is a very real enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. He's not just hoping you fail a test or have a bad day. He wants to take your life. He wants to take your testimony. He wants to snuff you out and kill you and not let you be a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wants from you. And so you gotta keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and know who your real enemy is. It's really hard to be mad at someone when you're praying for them. You pray for your enemies? Man, it's funny how God softens your heart when you start to pray for an enemy. It's funny how God softens their heart. Is there somebody you're mad at? Do you feel like you're in a spiritual battle with a person? Maybe someone that I just mentioned and your blood pressure's already starting to rise. Hey, hey, just start to pray for them. See what God does, okay? You can't be mad at somebody that you're praying for. God will change your heart and God will change their heart. Number four, trust in God's bigger plan. We need to trust in God's bigger plan. Then they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him. This is verse 58. And then listen to this. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, a few chapters later, Saul gets a new name. Does anybody know what his new name is? Paul. That's right. And God takes this guy who approved of Stephen's death approved of the execution, God changes him, gives him an incredible testimony. We're gonna get into that in a few weeks. And he becomes the greatest church planter, missionary, wrote half the New Testament and all the Bible. You see, God has a bigger picture. And God will use your delayed flight. God will use your spiritual opposition, whatever's happening in your marriage, whatever's happening with your kids. God can use all of that because he's got a bigger picture in mind. I know you know Acts 1-8 because we've been talking about it every week. Every week I read Acts chapter 1, verse 8 for you. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. 
At this point, so far in the book of Acts, all the ministry that's been taking place has been taking place in Jerusalem. And I know you know Acts 1.8. Today I want to teach you Acts 8.1. Okay, so look at Acts 8.1. It says this, And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So how did the gospel get outside of the walls of Jerusalem? Persecution. So God is using all of this opposition because he has a bigger picture in view. And he's using all of this to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. He's fulfilling the prophecy of Acts 1-8 to the ends of the earth. I wonder what God's bigger plan is for you. When you think about this persecution in your life, this opposition in your life, this battle that you're walking through, I wonder how God's gonna use this 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. When you're well off into heaven, I wonder how God's still gonna use this in your church family, with your own physical family. Investments of time, investments of money, things that you're doing right now to invest in the kingdom of Jesus. I wonder how he's gonna use all of this in the bigger picture of his sovereign plan. I wonder how he's gonna use it all. Because you know he won't waste any of it. God is gonna use all of this for our good and his glory. Number five, we need to anticipate our future home. Anticipate our future home. When Stephen looked up, he saw Jesus welcoming him home. There's a preacher, um, his name's Francis Chan. He hasn't been around lately, but I, I got this illustration from him. And he said, many times we as believers, we like to think of our, our life as this continuum. And if you think of your, your life like this long rope, and it started at one point, but it goes on into eternity. It's something that never, never ends. And the interesting thing about our life is, is that when you look at your life, the part that we spend on earth is about this long. This long. But the decisions that we make in this life, they carry on and they matter for what is not next, what is the life to come. And all of these decisions, they really do matter in eternity, but sometimes we get so wrapped up thinking about this life that we don't ever think about all of this and what God's gonna do here. And so we're constantly thinking like this, oh man, I hope that this decision makes it okay so that we'll have a really good retirement here. Oh, I so hope that everything's gonna be okay whenever I start my career here. Oh man, I can't wait to see how my kids turn out. I just so hope everything's gonna be okay here. And in God's economy, the way that he thinks about all of this, he's wondering, well, what's it going to be like here and down here and here and here and here and here? You have so much more life in you that you can't even fathom it. And imagine that this goes on and on for eternity and eternity and eternity. When Stephen gazed up into heaven, he understood, these are just stones. I'm doing something so good, so right. I'm about to be in the presence of Jesus in the kingdom of God for all of eternity. Sometimes we get so focused on what's happening in this life that we forget about the life to come. We're gonna spend so much time with him. So I wonder what spiritual opposition you're facing right now. And I wonder how God's gonna use that, not just in this life, but for all of eternity. You know, Stephen, Stephen was just one of seven deacons. When I think about Stephen, sometimes I just wonder, why Stephen? And there were six others, why, why Stephen? And then sometimes I, I, I see what God's doing here in this church, and I think, God, why me? Why do I get to be part of all of this? I don't know if you ever feel that way. Why you? I mean, the more I get to know you, uh, the more I realize you could be in other places on Sunday mornings. But for whatever reason, God has you here and of all the places you could be, sometimes you have to pinch yourself because you, you can't believe you're here. Of all the places that you could be in your life, God has you here. And I just wonder what God's doing with you. You know, sometimes they feel like disappointments, but maybe it's just a divine appointment. Maybe your spiritual opposition is not really a disappointment. It's something that God's gonna use as a divine appointment. When I'm under spiritual attack, sometimes I like to remind myself of what the psalmist said in Psalm 42. David was uh, downcast, and he's depressed, and he sees his own sinful inclinations, temptations in this world, and he looks around, and it's almost like he has this out-of-body experience. It's almost, almost like he's, you know, schizophrenic. 
and he starts talking to his soul. And he says, soul, why are you downcast? I will put my faith in the Lord. Every now and then in the midst of spiritual battles, maybe we need to do that. Maybe we just need to say, soul, why are you downcast? I will put my faith in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray that we would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Sometimes this world is so distracting and we get caught up in just the minute details of this life, but we have so much more to live for in heaven. So God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And God, I wanna pray right now for our church family, many of whom are in spiritual battles right now. God, I pray that you would bring help to those who need it. I pray that you bring comfort to those who need it. I pray that you would help them to fix their eyes on the word of God, the truth of God that teaches us about life and how life really is. I pray that the Holy Spirit would be strong and mighty in them. And God, I pray that you would help us to look to heaven where we're gonna be with you forever in a place where there's no more suffering and no more spiritual opposition. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.